everybody. Welcome to our 2020 Rest and Relaxation Weekend, our worship service. Uh, this is our first attempt, as you know, at a live service in many months, um, and it's exciting, and it's a little bit scary for me to have more than four faces looking back at me, <laughs> uh, but it's exciting as well. And it really wonderful. It is wonderful to join together, uh, both physically and online, as we upload this service later. So, however or whenever you're joining us, we welcome you uh, into this time of worship. Today's service will be a bit more simplified as we uh, give space for our musicians to have a little bit of a rest. Um, Nathan and Steve are are still on duty to help us get this together. Um, so today we're going to worship with prayer, scripture, and a message, and then we'll continue on with our uh, rest and relaxation and, and fellowship together. We want to thank God for this beautiful day. The sun is out, the skies are blue, and I'm thankful for the way that he created this world and the way that he brings us together, uh, and we have this opportunity in this space uh, during this time uh, to worship together. As we enter into our time of worship, let us pause, center our hearts, and ready ourselves to hear what God has in store for us today. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for who you are, for your wonderful goodness, your love, your grace. We know that you send these to us, you give these to us freely and often, and we thank you for that. We thank you for those who were able to come out this morning, and we pray also, and we, we lift those who will be joining us later or who aren't with us. We miss them, um, but we pray that uh, that you will that as they worship with us, uh, you will challenge their hearts and open their hearts as well. God, we thank you for the opportunities for fellowship together and to just be together. We thank you for this time of worship. And it's you that we give our honor and glory to today. In your name we pray, amen. Seth will be reading our scripture for us this morning, so let us continue uh, through the reading of scripture. Good morning, our... Scripture. Yeah, I'm here. Am I getting okay? How about that? Okay, our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, and we will be starting in chapter 8 with verse 31. Jesus then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders the chief priest, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And now chapter 9, Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 2. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. Then he was transfigured before them. 
His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, is it good for us to be here? Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter did not know what to say, they were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them, except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what was ri- or discussing what rising from the dead meant. They th- uh, they they came to Capernaum. When they went, when he was in the house, he asked them, "What were you arguing about on the road?" But they kept quiet because of the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me but the one who sent me. off. Are we good? Okay. I'll have a a prayer for Jason here before the sermon. Thank you, Lord, for Jason and for bringing him to this congregation and for the work that he has been doing uh, among your people here. Lord, you have given him a message, and we ask that uh, as he speaks to us that your words find a place in our heart this week as we go out and about in our daily lives. Amen. Today we are Today we are in week 8 of the study of the gospel of Mark. Last week John Troyer brought us a message that had some passages that brought forth a number of pieces that seemed almost foreign or uncouth or unallowed during this time with uh, with the midst of of large gatherings and people not washing their hands as they passed out food. And here we are today with our first gathering in many months. And I have to be honest, we are each likely feeling a range of emotions. Should we be doing this? It's so good to be together. I'm uncomfortable. I hope Jason keeps this short. We should do this every week. I wish they would put a mask on. I wish I could take my mask off. We're missing those who aren't here. And those who are watching us later may wish that they were here, but but aren't feeling ready for this yet. And the list of thoughts and feelings and emotions goes on and on and on, and they're all okay. John gave us three basic elements last week for us to hold on to and to approach these emotions with as we, as we weigh them honestly, but also lay them at the feet of Jesus so we don't fall into our emotions with a religious attitude of just doing it because we're following rules, but because we're living into the life and the spirit of following Jesus. The first thing he gave us was gratitude, to remember our previous engagements with God, and gratitude for the times that he's been at work in our lives. Then he said we need to work through our distress with God and know that God sees you, God hears you, and when you take the time to slow down and listen, we can hear God say, I have heard your cry. He is with us in our distress, in our tough moments, and taking the time to enter into that space can help put it in an eternal perspective, and we can know that God is holding us. 
And the third thing he brought us last week was joy. When we enter into this space with gratitude and releasing any potential distresses in our lives into God's hands, our heart can take on the posture of joy. And even in the suffering, even in persecution, even in the midst of a pandemic and the emotions that come with that, we can exude joy in the delight of knowing that our lives are in the hands of Jesus Christ. Today we have another big section of scripture. And I encourage you to study through it or read through it this week as we won't be getting into all of it. But we're looking at Mark, t- Mark 8, 31 to Mark 10, 52. Uh, two, and a, two, two plus chapters. We'll be focusing on a few parts that seem to be repeated at times. In the sections that we'll be looking at today, we see Jesus once again sharing a couple of insights with his disciples about, about the new kingdom he's bringing and how it once again, it, it, it flips the thinking that ruled the day for the leadership style, for a kingdom beyond what would seem obvious in looking at the physical and living into the eternal. Also in this section, Jesus is trying to prepare the disciples for the end of his time on earth and what that will look like. All these ideas Jesus laid out in front of his disciples several times, and they still didn't get it. We can take some encouragement from that, as sometimes it takes us several times to grasp grasp what grasp hold of what Jesus is trying to give us. But Jesus continues with gentleness, continues to prepare us for our next steps that he has for us. I think this message is timely for us as we continue through uncertain times, navigating and leading through things that we have never been through before. In a world of uncertainty, which if we look at it, what is certain? We're never guaranteed what tomorrow is going to bring anyway. But in a world of uncertainty, here are a couple things that I believe are certain. First, God is always presenting us with the next steps and giving us an opportunity to live into his kingdom. And second, we all have the responsibility to lead. And to lead is to serve To serve is to love one another, and to love one another is to love God. And you may think, well, I don't have a leadership position. I'm not a leader. You would be wrong. A position does not give you the ability to lead. Your influence is what gives you the ability to lead. And each and every one of us has a position of influence, whether it's with our family, our coworkers, our friends, or within our church. Each and every one of us here has influence. We then have the choice of how we're going to leverage that influence for ourselves or for a greater kingdom. Okay, jumping back into our scripture for today. Mark chapter 8, verse 31. Jesus predicts his death. If you read the full scripture for today, you'll see that Jesus does this three times. And we'll look at these times a a little bit here as we move on. Jesus begins teaching them that the Son of Man will suffer many things and will will be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and after three days later, he will rise again. And notice it says he spoke plainly about this. He didn't talk about this in parables like the disciples were often used to hearing him talk. He just laid it out there. And what he is saying shouldn't be a surprise. It's what the Hebrew scriptures would have prophesied about the Messiah. The disciples would have known these passages. But we see here their ideas of this new kingdom that Jesus was bringing were still tied to to life on earth. Were still tied to a kingdom that would free them from the Romans and years of oppression. Jesus couldn't die. If he did that, how could this kingdom come into place? And likely the disciples start talking with with one another about what Jesus is saying. And and maybe they nominate Peter to be the one to approach Jesus. Or or maybe because Peter's often the first one to just speak up and say the first thing on his mind, he he stepped forward. He's like, "Um, Jesus, you're kind of scaring the guys here. We've got a good thing going on. 
Our crowds are getting bigger. The people are really buying into this love one another thing. Let's not ruin it with this, all this dying nonsense. But Jesus, knowing it wasn't nonsense, but would be a required part of fulfilling the old covenant and ushering in a new system, says to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You don't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Get behind me, Satan. Not what we want to be called or how we want Jesus to respond to us when we talk with him, right? I wonder if, if Peter's rebuke to Jesus to stop all this nonsense took Jesus for, for but a moment to, to his time in the desert when he was tempted by Satan. And in this moment, maybe, maybe Jesus' humanness may have wanted to take what Peter encouraged him to, to no longer talk of these things and to find a new way, another way to usher in his kingdom. But his divinity, his godness wouldn't have it, as he knew there was no other way. And he calls the crowd and says to them that they too must take up their cross for the gospel, this good news. And if they tried to hold on to their lives, to the gains that, that this world tells us to go after, they will lose their life for eternity. But if they let go of trying to gain all they can while they're here and live into the life that Jesus has in store for them, they would gain eternity, a gift more precious and beautiful than anything we could ever imagine earning or building for ourselves here. As we keep moving on in Mark 9, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up high on a mountain where these three disciples get to witness a pretty incredible thing. Imagine this with me. We're following Jesus up. Maybe you're one of those three, and you're following Jesus up the mountain. And he's standing there before you when his clothes, maybe already somewhat white, or maybe they were colored, we don't know, but his clothes suddenly become this new bright white, almost glowing, something like they've never seen before. And then suddenly, there standing with him are Elijah and Moses, like, like the Elijah and the Moses, arguably the two biggest figures in Israelite history. Have any of you ever met a celebrity or a hero of yours? Here's what typically happens. The few times it's happened to me anyway, you get tongue-tied, you say the first thing that comes to your mind and it really doesn't make that much sense, and then later you're like, did I really say that? <laughs> Peter did the same thing. Again, usually the first one to speak, he says what he knows. Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. He knew what they were witnessing was something incredibly special. And then he says, let us build you three shelters, one for each of you. Like Elijah and Moses and Jesus needed a shelter in that moment, right? In verse 6, it says, he did not know what to say. They were so frightened. <clears throat> you can imagine their hearts were pounding as they witnessed this event. And then a cloud comes and a voice from the cloud says, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. And then when they look around again, there's no one there but themselves and Jesus. And Jesus tells them to keep what they saw to themselves until after he has risen from the dead. So they kept this to themselves, talking with each other about what, it, about what rising from the dead meant. That's the second time Jesus predicts his death. And we jump to the third time. We jump forward into the next chapter. We jump to the third time he predicts his death in Mark 10, 32 to 34, if you're following along. Jesus, again with the 12, tells them what is going to happen. In verse 33, he says, we're going up to Jerusalem. They had been traveling from, from in chapter 9 where we were at. They had been traveling, gradually getting their way towards Jerusalem. And he says, we're going up to Jerusalem. They were actually heading south, which to us we would say going down there, right? We go down to Indianapolis. 
Um, but Jerusalem was up on the top of a mountain, so they were going up. They were down in the valley. So Jesus says, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And maybe this time, as he's saying it, there's a, a different heaviness in his voice, a different purpose, and maybe as he's looking up the, their path up towards where Jerusalem would be in the distance as he's saying this. And they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise. This time, Peter and the disciples may be feeling and sensing that deeper purpose, that deeper meaning in his voice. They didn't say anything. They just followed him up the trail, up the path. Jesus had been trying to prepare them for what was going to come. It took them a while. And sometimes it does for us, too. Just like the disciples, Jesus is at work in our lives, too. We may not get it the first time. We may not understand what he's trying to tell us the second time or third time or fourth time. But Jesus is patient. And he's going to keep telling us again and again and again. And he's going to keep giving us opportunities to understand the next steps he has for us. In these uncertain times, this one thing we can be certain of, God is at work. He hasn't hit the pause button like some of us may have. God is at work, and he wants us to be as well. Next, we're going to look at a couple more scripture that gives us some important God-centered principles, both for our approach to life and our approach to leadership and how he chooses to use us to get his message out to the masses. Moving back into Mark chapter 9, we're going to look at verses 33 to 37. The disciples are at it again. They're living their best life focused on the realities that are important in this world in the system that they grew up in, and the one that is still present and strong in our society today. The disciples were likely hanging back a bit behind Jesus as, as he's leading the way as they were coming up to Capernaum. The disciples are talking among themselves, well, it was more arguing, really, about who among them was the greatest. You remember doing that, right? When you were younger and playing backyard football or baseball or, or something like that, only one of you could be Joe Namath or, or Troy Aikman or Ricky Henderson or Jose Canseco or whoever your, the big player was. Kenny Lofton? For, yeah. <laughs> Not as many people know our Indians, do they? Whoever the star was of your favorite team, only one of you could be that person. And the disciples were doing this, this same kind of thing. They were laying out what they brought to the table and, and comparing it with the others that they had in their select group. And we still do this. It's our human tendency, the drive to be great, to compare ourselves with those around us, what they have that we don't or what we do well that, that somebody else doesn't. And when they were in the house that they were traveling to, Jesus asks them, what were you guys arguing about? But they kept quiet because they didn't want to admit what th that they were arguing about who was the greatest. And then Jesus sits down and knowing what they were talking says this in verse 35. Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. Then he takes a child in his arms and he says to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Now, this isn't a big deal to us, but, but children weren't really seen as a valuable part of society. 
And Jesus is illustrating again how this kingdom is going to be different. It's not a top-down power scheme, but it's just the opposite. It's one based on, on building others up, on putting others first, ahead of ourselves. Even these lowly children, we need to take the stance of a servant. And this little message about children, where it would take some time, would eventually change the fate of so many children who, who would have been seen as unwanted, who would have been out on the streets, as first century Christians would have started to understand this message in a new way. And they would, have, would bring these children in off the streets and bear the financial burden and responsibility of caring for them on their own. Now, I'm not sure how much time passes. We're going to jump into Mark 10, 35 to 45. I'm not sure how much time passes, but this previous conversation, uh, the section right before the scripture, didn't sink deep enough for James and John, the, the sons of Zebedee. And maybe it was their nickname, the, the sons of thunder, that got into their heads a little bit. And maybe, but maybe it was because the, uh, even among the 12, James and John, along with Peter, uh, were, were kind of given a little bit of extra preferential treatment. They got a little extra time with Jesus that some of the others didn't get. And you'll notice the passage right before this is the one, is the passage that we just talked about a bit ago, where they're heading up to Jerusalem. And Jesus tells them with, with a little different tone and purpose. He predicts his death for the third time. So jump back into that passage with me as we, as we go into this section. So James and John, and how the disciples are behind Jesus. James and John maybe walk a little bit quicker and catch up to Jesus. And maybe the disciples think that, that they're going to try and talk to him about what he said. And James and John say, Jesus, we, we have a favor to ask of you. We really, really, really want you to, to do it for us. They're, and Jesus replies, well, what, what, do you want to, what do you want me to do for you? And maybe they're a little bashful. Well, you, you know, we, let one of us sit on your right hand and the other at your left when you come into your glory. Jesus had just predicted his death. And they're asking to come in. And sit on it right and left. They're still thinking of the kingdom of this world. They're still thinking Jesus is going to bring in this new kingdom. They're asking for a place of prominence. Like, like the priests, like the kings had a right and left hand man. They too wanted to be in that place. And Jesus responds, you don't know what you are asking. Can you drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus tells them that they will drink the cup and be baptized with the baptism that he's baptized with. But to sit at my right hand and my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. And then the arguments start again. The other ten, hearing what James and John were, were asking Jesus or talking to Jesus about, it says they became, in verse 41, they became indignant. Indignant is, is anger or annoyance at what is perceived as unfair treatment. So Jesus calls them all together again. You guys, we've, we've been over this. But I'll tell you again, I'll share this with you again. You know how the Gentiles rule, right? They play the power card. They let other people know that they're in charge, and they make life hard on them. And they let the people close to them have a little bit of po that power, and they have the power to do the same, and they do. They, they wield it over you. And then he says these next four words, and this is so important for us as well. If we want to live into his kingdom, he says these next four words in verse 43. Not so with you. Meaning, the way you have seen leadership and religions, both Hebrew and Gentile, the way that you have been treated by the Romans who have been in charge, not so with you. 
you argue about, about who's going to be the leader in my kingdom, about who's going to be on my right and my left, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave for all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It's not important what title we have or what power we can wield from the position that we're in and hold over people. For even Jesus Christ himself didn't come to be served, but to serve, to become like a servant, which is a lowly position, not a position of power. But this posture, this stance, may be even more important in our time right now. I'm missing having us all at church. But at the same time, I think we have an opportunity right now to redefine who we are and our purpose as a church body. See, God hasn't hit the pause button. There are so many opportunities for us to reach out into our community, to be a place of hope and love and care and becoming a servant. Being a servant isn't a noun. It's not a title. It's a verb. It's a position of action. And that action isn't the action of going to church and coming back home and and doing what we do. No way. It's about the ministry outside of the church building. It's about the posture that we come before our neighbors, our friends, our families, our enemies, and anyone who comes before us. How can we serve them? This idea of becoming a servant... Becoming a slave of all combined with the thoughts of the first part of this message that that God's going to continue putting his next steps for us in front of us. These combine together to know that God's at work. God is presenting next step to us as well. And in, in what ways may he be sharing insights into the next steps that he has for you? Do you have some ideas some messages that are being repeated or some thoughts that keep coming around. Maybe there's something there for you to pay attention to. And as you focus in on on those repeated insights that you may have, you may may realize that they're from God. And it's likely that they're going to be in an area, in a space in someone's life where you can step in and serve. Speaking the truth of Christ's love from the humble position of offering yourself to serve. And in this, you will be a great witness. In a world that is uncertain, here's what I'm certain of. First, God is at work. He's always putting forth new opportunities to listen, to hear, and to understand his next steps for us. Second, there's a really good chance that his next steps for us will involve a ministry of serving. And it will likely be in a place that's outside of the church building. And third, and to close this message, I'll leave you with these words. Everyone is here. Everyone here is a leader. Being a leader is about your influence, not a title or a position. And we all have the responsibility to lead. So I'll leave you with this. To lead is to serve. To serve is to love one another. And to love one another is to love God. Amen.